Buenas neves, senores and senoritas. Welcome to INC Live for a very special episode of the INC Preview Show. My name is Carl Beamage and I am joined by the man on the right hand side of my screen. He is the Slowpoke Rodriguez to my Speedy Gonzalez. He's my friend and yours. It's Joe Neal. Joe, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, glad to be here. Glad to be the Gory Guerrero to your El Santo. You know, digging deep for my uh, tag teams. I decided to go with um, the classic. You know, a really classic uh, luchador team. Because I have to be honest, when because you usually like to go for some sort of um, tag team for your sort of um, mm -hmm. pairing, and I was expecting Eddie and Chavo. I I was I almost did the Lucha Brothers was what I was planning. Then I went. I think I've already done them, and uh, I was gonna do Eddie and Chavo, but then it's it's gonna be like Reservoir Dogs. We're both just gonna argue over who's Eddie. <laughs> I like that one. I have to be honest, I was a little bit unsure about my pairing as well, because uh, obviously you have uh, Mexican heritage uh, on your uh, family. Are Mexican people offended by Speedy Gonzalez? It's one of those things I've always heard it, right? And But I've never seen it in real life. Um, and if so, then the people who introduced me to Speedy Gonzalez was my grandma and grandpa on my mom's side who were like, you know, pure immigrants, you know, like legal immigrants that came over from, uh, from like Mexico. So shocker to me, you know, if they, if that's true, I, I, you know, I mean, I was always watching it growing up at their house. So you may be wondering why we're making all these sort of allusions, to Mexican culture. Uh, this is of course, Norcia UFC, which is coming up. Now, normally we don't bother when it comes to preview shows for the fight night. Like, could you imagine us covering, like, 42 events on this show, some of them taking place at the apex, like Mackenzie Dern versus Angela Hill, and we're talking about all of the undercard fights on that one. So normally we don't bother, but with this one, Noche UFC, so we've got a big celebration with the UFC are putting a lot of um, sort of marketing behind. But also as well, first time since 2020, we have a title fight which is taking place on a fight night. The last time took place in 2020, which was Davison Figueredo and Joe Benavidez 2 on Fight Island. And one of the things it's done, Joe, and this sort of be our first discussion topic of the show, is it's made people question what is sort of the best way for the UFC to use its sort of B-tier champions, the people that the company don't trust to headline pay-per-views. It's probably, this might be the way to do it, to see how popular this is. Especially with their like whole gimmick of it's a Mexican fight night in Vegas, um, you know, kind of thing that they're kind of doing. Um, I mean, I, I, I mean, I think it's, it's on one hand, I think it's probably the way to go. But on the other hand, I mean, I understand doing this with Valentina, but not the pound for pound best women's fighter on the planet, right? You know, I mean, I looked at the rankings, <laughs> but jokes aside, yeah, I. <laughs> Yeah, jokes aside, um, no, I think it's totally fair to, to do this. Um, you know, I think especially, look at what it did for the lightweight or the, the flyweight belt. That belt can headline now, you know, and uh, I think eventually this can headline, this belt can. I find that there's always sort of free schools of thought when you talk to the fans over how they should use these sort of B-tier champions. <clears throat> I apologize mm. again. It's always a bad omen, you know, when you start coughing right at the start of the show. You just think, oh, God, it's going to be one of those days. So for me, there's always three schools of thought. The first is the one the majority of the fans think, which is you put them as the core main to sort of like one of your big megastars, like your Connors or your John mm. Joneses of the world. And I can see the value in that. Personally, I don't think it's as effective as what other people think it is. Like, Shevchenko's been the core main to, like, John Jones before, and I don't think that ever did much for her popularity. The second is to prop up a headliner that maybe does need some help. Like, Leon Edwards versus Bilal Muhammad probably won't get a lot of casual viewers watching in that, that fight. And that's no offense to both guys who mm -hmm. I hold in a lot of respect. But if you had yeah. Leon versus Bilal plus Grasso plus Pantoja... Those casual fans think, hmm, I'm getting three title fights for the price of one here. I might take that chance. They did it with Usman versus Colby, and I think it worked very well. And the third yeah, is what absolutely. we're seeing here, 
which is putting these sort of B tier champions as TV main events. And TV title fights don't happen all that often. So there's a sort of novelty to that. But also as well, like you said, it tests the waters to see whether or not that champion might be tried as a main eventer. Like Figueredo won the belt off Benavidez. And I think the success mm -hmm. of that card made them say, you know what, we've got a card in December and he headlined against Brandon Moreno. I think that worked really well. Yeah. It, it boosted him like crazy. You know, he was a fighter of the year candidate that year. You know, he was a, probably a lot of people's pick for fighter of the year that year in 2020. Um, and then I think we had, even though it wasn't free, it was free, if I remember correctly. I don't, I don't remember paying for it. Um, I'm not writing myself out here, I swear. <laughs> but um, was a Jan Blahovich Glover Teixeira. It was yeah. technically a UFC. It wasn't a fight night, but um, it was a proper UFC card. But it was free. It was, you know, given a freebie. Yeah, because I think 267 nice. was a week before 268. And I think the UFC yeah. realized that making people pay twice is going to be a bit, bit underhand. So I think they gave that one for free. And it was in Abu Dhabi as well. So it'd be, I think mm -hmm. they were willing to take the hit because it'd be on earlier. Yeah. I, I, I feel like nowadays they would still charge us. I don't know why. It hasn't been that long since. Still feel like they would do it. But um, that card was great. You know, obviously. And uh, I, I think I think having like free, having a free card like this, you know, um, free cards are nice. Free title fights, though. Like, I know a ton of people who got into the sport just because, like, and there's nothing to do. I'm bored. It's Saturday night. I'm going to watch some sports. You know, oh, it's in between my sports seasons. And there's a fight going on. I'll check it out. And then they're in the sport. You know, 2020, I know a lot of people who got into the sport in 2020. Like, I know people who are, you're not going to believe this. You especially won't believe this, who say Hamzad is their favorite fighter because of 2020. You know, no sports. What do I do? I'm not the fighter I don't have the problem with. I'm not the person is, well, we're trying to keep this PG, so I won't say Yeah, exactly. Off. Yeah, we're, we, I just thought that you would find that kind of funny of like, that him? You know, you'd have that Arrested Development moment. <laughs> so as mentioned before, the big selling point of this fight night is no cheer UFC. So there was a big aim to sort of build it around Mexican Independence Day, uh, have a lot of Mexican fighters on the card, which obviously didn't go to plan, which we'll get into in a lot more detail. The big thing that stands out, though, is Noche UFC, the big Mexican celebration, isn't taking place in Mexico. Do you think the UFC are missing a trick there? Uh, I think it's really funny that this is a Mexican, a Mexican fight card to them. And it's like, it's in Vegas. And I can already hear Dana White twist this. Like, you don't, you goofs, like, say it out loud. Where are we? Las Vegas, Las Spanish. We're in, Me I can already hear him try this. Um, so on one hand, I'm like, that feels a little disingenuous, you know. But on the other hand, I also remember what happened last time we went to Mexico. So... Okay. You know. Michael Bisping hiding mm -hmm. under the desk because he's being pelted with debris. Yeah. And then, well, what's it called? Uh, it, it, what a PR nightmare that this, the community, you know, uh, I, I don't want to say anything. What a PR nightmare it would be if um, the people who, you know, like want to like attack people for what they say, rightfully so, in some cases... Thank God they don't speak Spanish because I'm not going to translate for Yaya Rodriguez to them. I know what he said. If you know what he said, hey, you know, what he was saying up there was uh, I was cracking up because of what a um, a poop show it was it turned into. And then it just got worse and worse. And I went, oh, this is really bad. Am I witnessing history here? And then I felt really ashamed because I realized, oh, man. That's where I'm from. <laughs> um, it wasn't, it was a, a little, you know, it was a little awkward, but yeah, it is. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm of the firm belief you can like, we're just not going to go to Mexico for a couple of years. Maybe they're still on a suspension, I guess you could say. 
So normally when it comes to these preview shows, our normal format is that we sort of gloss over the prelims, look at some of the fights that might interest us, and we break down every fight on the main card. For this one though, it's going to be a little bit truncated, so we're going to give an overview of the entirety of the card, and then do a deep dive on the main event. So you can see the entirety of the card on our screen right now. Now I want to stress that we're recording this on a Saturday morning, so the card is subject to change, and I hate to say it Joe, there has been a lot of changes on this card so far. So I've got a list of the names here that were originally scheduled to appear on this card and have unfortunately pulled out. Shavkat Rachmanov, Kelvin Gastelum, Chris Curtis, um, Fluffy Hernandez, Cynthia Calvillo, Daniel Rodriguez, your boy Pontanibio, and Asman Yusedo. So that is a good chunk of very talented fighters who unfortunately have had to pull out from this card. Sounds like a good card, honestly, if you had all those guys. Except Cynthia Calvillo. Well, she's a uh, name. She's a name, and Dana likes to, yeah. every time and again, try and push Dana her. Likes but... her. Yeah. Six fight went losing streak. She's Sam Alvey. <laughs> uh, um, but, uh, yeah, you know, uh, that would have been a good card. The Shavkat one hurts the most, because I think that guy's the future. So, very high on him. And uh, I wasn't too happy with the Kelvin Gastelum matchmaking, honestly. But that said, um, I was really looking forward to seeing him fight. Yeah, because the issue we've got with Shavkat as well is we've got this incredibly hyped prospect who's flying through the rankings. But because Welterweight is, like we said this years ago, like Welterweight is a diva weight class. And none of mm -hmm. those guys are on the top five are going to want to try and risk their ranking to fight this guy. So you've got to turn to the, mm. the Kelvin Gastelums who've got nothing to lose. Oh, only Gilbert Burns is the only one of those guys who's like, yeah, I'll do it. You know? And that's why we love him. Yeah. And, but I also go, do I really want to see Gilbert Burns lose to two mega prospects? What do you mean? This? He's only lost to one. Oh, I mean, if he, if he nearly, he, he did nearly, um, what's it called? Uh, decapitate what's his face uh hamzad with that soccer kick <laughs> what do you think the ufc would have oh, done man. if that landed uh he not would have fought ever again i think he would have kicked him and like sent his head into the stratosphere i think it would have ended both their careers yeah. admittingly uh, uh i think because I, I and i don't mean that in a violent way i think it would hurt like the durability of hamzad for a long time and no one, everyone would only think of Gilbert Burns as that guy who, that guy, you know, punted him across the across the arena. So we'll break down some of the fights that take our interest on this card here, and obviously we'll go into the main event in a lot more detail as sort of our sort of highlight of the show. So the biggest fight we're going to be talking about is, of course, the core main event. Now, even though there have been a lot of dropouts from this card. I think the core main event does make up for it a little bit because we've got Kelvin Ho Kevin Holland who is taking on Jack Della Maddalena. Now, it's safe to say a few months ago, Jack Della Maddalena was one of the hyped prospects in the welterweight division. Then the Basil Hafez fight happens. Even though he won that fight, and I did rewatch it, and his win is a lot more convincing when you rewatch it back, I'd still make the argument it did hurt his stock. Yeah. It hurt his stock pretty bad because this was a guy we were very, very high up on. Uh, you know, the Randy Brown fight was a big, in my opinion, a big showcase for him uh, against a very tough and underrated guy. And then the Hafez fight happened. And, you know, I used to see on Twitter, it's like, oh, it's JDM fight week. You see that? No, no one's going to say that, I think, next week. I, I'm not really expecting it. And uh, I still like the guy. Obviously, he's awesome, but... That hurt his stock. Yeah. Just a couple of... It's raised the sort of question marks because I think there was a lot of people. He fought that... Um, he fought that Russian wrestler. I, I, the near, Imadayev, I think it was. I think he fought him at 275. And people thought, if there's any type of guy that's going to be testing Jack Della's grappling, it's going to be him. And he blew him out in the first round. Mm -hmm. So we thought that test had been passed. And then, of course, mm -hmm. Hafez com comes in holds him down and there's some questions about him constantly going for guillotines and Daniel Cormier saying it's tight when it never is. Um, 
and it's it's raised some doubts about the guy and i think that i think kevin holland's going to be a good litmus test to see whether or not he learned the lessons from that fight because kevin holland good run of form he's already won two fights this year pons nibio and michael chiesa um he's starting to embrace the grappling side of the game a little bit more he submitted chiesa in his last fight so i think it's going to be a good all-around test to see how good jack Della is whether he can build up that momentum again if I think it's I think that's the perfect way to describe this fight because Kevin Holland I'm really happy he's choosing to stay at 170 personally um, I think this is his weight class for him I don't think 185 was a great fit um, I mean he was awesome at 185 don't get me wrong he got very very close to a title fight at 185 but I think he's potentially so much more at 170 because he's not having he's not just going to get beat by the big guys who decide to shoot a double on him and with JDM I think if he wins you know potentially shows that okay we can start you know gushing about a ceiling again which is very fun yeah because he's a very entertaining fighter smooth as butter boxing it's amazing. And I'm not talking to Homer Simpson boxing. This is the real deal. You know, Wait, sweet science all the way. When you said butter boxing, I immediately thought butter bean. <laughs> I mean, he was the man too. I mean, it's, it's, I, I, remember I, saw you, I saw a thumbnail on YouTube where it was him fighting Conor McGregor in a boxing <laughs> ring. I mean, you're, you're going to tell me that didn't happen? Come on. Yep. <laughs> Those thumbnails, there's, there's loads of them. Like, it's McGregor versus, like, that 300-pound bodybuilder sometimes. And I saw one where they sort of photoshopped to try and look like Misha Tate was topless. I'm not... I, I, I don't like this line of questioning. I'm not saying I clicked on it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's... It's that sort of catch-22 when it comes to uh, thumbnails. It's something which I'm sort of... I go through with all the designs that I do. Is sort of like... Do you go for something mm. that's going to attract eyeballs or do you want to be integral and tell people what you're actually talking about? It's, um, I think it's something that all YouTubers yeah. go through. Yeah, it, it's, it's definitely, I, I, it, I, I think of it as like, do you make that deal like with the devil, so to speak, you know, of like, do I sell my soul for the clickbaits? It's all like, your soul to Satan himself. Yeah. Oh my God. He's shaking hands with the devil. Um, and, uh, all I'm saying is we haven't, we, if we're, if we're at that stage in the channel, it means we got a good little bit before we, we kill our own, you kill your own creation with a lethal dose of bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's how I remember that line being. Yeah. Thanks, OSW. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and also please check out OSW review, probably three of the most entertaining men on YouTube. Yeah, you and I, I you introduced me to him and I watch him weekly. <laughs> like if, if it's just one video, sometimes it's one video. Sometimes I'm not at liberty to say how much I was on YouTube watching them. They're fantastic. They're so funny. Well, bollocks was what a lot of people were thinking about Raul Rosas after his last fight. He's going to be back in action today. Uh, he's going to be taking on Terence Mitchell on the main card. And I'm going to pose this question when it comes to Rosas. Obviously, he lost his last fight against Christian Rodriguez, which turned into a pretty one-sided fight. And there was a lot of concerns over how UFC-ready this guy was. Did the UFC underestimate Christian Rodriguez? Or did they under overestimate how good Raul Rosas is right now? I think they overestimated him. Um, I mean, he's younger than my brother. You know, it's kind of hard... It, maybe they didn't like overestimating him doesn't seem as fair because he's a very good grappler like Raul Rosas is a very good grappler but at the same time I mean like come on uh, it's it's definitely odd I think when you consider the fact that he's not he's 18 and Dana White's like this guy's the future get him on the contender series don't worry, we're going to sign him. This is the guy. And I understand wanting to establish a name of someone, especially, like, what if this kid is the unicorn and, you know, he does his, like, he starts kind of growing into Bellator and he becomes, like, 
their new megastar. He becomes what Aaron Pico should have been kind of thing. Um, that's a fear, I'm sure. But on the other hand, this, we're, this is the, supposed to be the best promotion in the world. And we're signing an 18-year-old unproven kid. And he won his first fight in the UFC. You know, after a contender series fight, he won his first fight in the UFC. Um, but that that was a, a shocking fight, just how dominated he was. And he didn't look good at all. And he he made you question. Like, it was a, such a bad night for him that like you questioned if he belonged here. And that's never something you want to say about a guy that you put all this time into building up and hyping up. So I, I, I feel like a little bit's on Raul Rosas and maybe Christian Rodriguez, you know, maybe he is like just a way tougher fight than he should have got at that time. Maybe it's like a case like that. But at the same time, I, I, I don't know how I feel about a guy younger than my brother uh, being in the UFC. Granted, my brother's getting old. He's 22 now, so he's getting old. I will say Anthony Pettis um, spoke very highly about Christian Rodriguez. He thinks that he's a real deal. Um, I think one of the big issues that happened with Rosas as well going into that fight is the UFC blew a lot of smoke up him. And, like, we've both been 18 as well. And when you're 18 years old, yeah. you think you are the bee's knees. You think that, like, nothing can stop you. And when you have the most powerful man in the sport telling how amazing you are and you're going to be a future champion. I think that that got to him, especially just the way he sort of like tried to bull rush Rodriguez. And once he wasn't having the success that he expected, there was an element of, okay, what do I do now? Yeah, he he was very cocky going into that fight and his whole career, he's been mega cocky, talking wild smack. You know, him meeting Rob, <clears throat> oh, excuse me, it's my curse now. Um, but, uh, him meeting Robbie Lawler was very cool because, you know, he was, said he was a huge Robbie Lawler fan I and mean, who isn't though, uh, but, um, uh, Robbie Lawler is just awesome, but yeah, you know, it's kind of crazy to be like, yeah, I'm 18 years old and I made 50 grand in my UFC debut. Like, okay. And the UFC is hyping him up and he was already a kind of a, a cocky guy, like very confident, especially because you're 18. Like you said, and uh, oh yeah, it, it it was just such a recipe for disaster, and uh, I loved every second of it. Um, call, call me cruel, but I had a good time laughing at it. <laughs> I, I'm a big fan of seeing Dana White's pet projects explode in his face. You know, nothing against this kid, but <laughs> I will say though, the matchmaking for this fight makes me think the UFC is still very high on him because he's going to be taking on mm -hmm. Terrence Mitchell. Now, Mitchell was in action very recently. Um, he had a fight up against Cameron Simon in July, which was his UFC debut, and uh, knocked out in the first round. In my opinion, I've seen Terrence Mitchell a few times within sort of like the UFC family, so he's been on the Ultimate Fighter. Obviously, he had that fight a few months ago. I don't think he's UFC caliber, and I think the UFC have booked this match to try and give us oh, the closest thing to a tune-up that they can. Yeah. I think so too. I mean, you can usually tell how much they like you uh, when, like, you look at their matchmaking and stuff like that, and um, and card placement. Yeah, yeah, that's another thing too. I mean, he's on the main card of a he's opening. He's the opener. It looks like on this main card um, with the title fight on it, and uh, obviously, I'm, you know, he's he's you know a Mexican fighter. He's from America, but Mexican heritage, obviously, but. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, it's a lot of it's definitely like, hey, it's the perfect spot for this kid, you know, to, to kind of push him yep. in that direction, so to speak. And the final sort of featured fight we'll talk about of the majority of the card, obviously we'll talk about the main event itself in a lot more detail, is the return of Tracy Cortez. Now, most people know her these days. I saw the eyebrows there. <laughs> Now, most people will know Tracy Cortez for her relationship with Brian Ortega. Obviously, she's an attractive girl, so people will know through that means. But she is also a very highly regarded 
uh, flyweight prospect and it's going to be the first time in a few years that she's fought she's so going to be taking on the lady ranked just below her in the flyweight rankings which is jasmine jizuda vicious i hope i pronounced that right and mm. as we said with jack della versus kevin holland a good litmus test to see how good tracy cortez still is after a long time away because this is this is the one in Erin Blanchfield's ten and one. She was the only girl to beat her so far in her career. So you think, hey, Erin's gotten this good. Why can't Tracy do the same thing? I mean, it would be awesome. I mean, this it, I'm always down for new prospects to come in and uh, you know kind of make a name for themselves. She has a ton of fanfare, ton of hype. Uh, she fought, you know, she's young, you know, younger at least. You know, she's she's around my age. But uh, <laughs> um, she's, uh, you know, 29, 10 straight wins, tons of fanfare. You know, a lot of it is her marketability, as we always kind of say. But no, I mean, like, she has, like, legitimate wins. That, tri that Aaron Blanchfield win has aged incredibly well. I mean, there's a lot of asterisks. Like, on Blanchfield that fight, was, course, like, but... 18, 19, like, second pro fight. Yeah. Yeah, but at the same time, it's like that's a feather in your cap if you're, you know, that the company is going to look to promote, obviously. And another thing, too, is uh, this division, it's finally good, you know, like ride this wave, like really get into it, you know, and it's I, I'm always down for more names in it. And her opponent just beat someone I'm really high on, Miranda Maverick. I wasn't expecting that at all. And. So definitely a, a good fight to keep an eye, eye out, an eye out on for the future of this division. Definitely so. Um, anything else on the rest of the card that you want to talk about? Um, I think Ro Roman Kopilov and Josh Frim sounds pretty all right, actually. I was surprised to see Roman Kopilov, Kopilov, I think. I was surprised to see Kopilov on the uh, prelims here. Like, bearing in mind he's yeah, a man fighter. Too. He, he looks good, you know, too. I mean, he's very flashy. He got a lot of finishes, head kicking people. He's fun. So, um, I mean, he was going to fight Fluffy Hernandez, looks like. But, nope, didn't happen. Uh, but I'm sure that fight will be pretty fun, at least. Maybe maybe he would have been on the main card, but with, like, the fights falling through, they just kind of pushed him down, you know? Yeah, I think, <laughs> I think four... No Mexican on this fight. I think four of the five uh, cards on the main card feature Mexicans, which probably played a part. I think Luke mm -hmm. Godinez is the only Mexican that's not on the main card. Yeah. It looks like... Or, uh... uh the Edgar Chavez, he's not on the main card. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think we should... Do you think the UFC could have done more to try and get more Mexican fighters on there? Because it's... Sort of similar to what we said last week with um, the Australia card. Like, UFC 290 happens. They load it with Australian talent. And yet there's nobody left for a card taking place in Sydney. Same sort of thing happened with um, the Mexican fighters. So there's no Yai Rodriguez, no Brandon Moreno, no um, Yasmin Haraguay, no Irene Aldana, because that's like a three-month turnaround. So I think, again, the UFC box himself into a corner and sort of quite short-sighted matchmaking. I mean, that's kind of their M.O. Now, nowadays, sadly. Um, it feels like Joe Neal for UFC matchmaker. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I mean, on one hand, I I, I got to be honest, uh, and this is someone who is very proud of where I come from, like lineage-wise and all this. Um, it's MMA isn't as big. In Mexico, I mean, obviously, it's getting huge. It's getting bigger and bigger, bigger and bigger. Brandon Moreno was a huge reason behind that, from what I understand. Um, Yair Rodriguez definitely helped out. But uh, uh, Kane Velasquez didn't help, which is always super funny to me. Uh, I love Kane, but he, w he wasn't big down there because um, he's too big. It was really hard for – it's it's legitimately it. Like, he wasn't, a, a, he wasn't a really a big draw down there. And uh, it's because his Spanish was – it's funny. He spoke fluent Spanish from all accounts, but they didn't like his Spanish. We're very odd people. Uh, I'm just going to be honest. <laughs> wasn't there a report? <laughs> but they, he was too big. Wasn't there a report that obviously they did that pay-per-view between him and Vadum, And uh -huh. 
from the reports I've read, the Doom was more of the sort of like hometown favorite. Yeah. Yeah, they liked for Doom more because he was like hanging out there just, you know, chilling out and everything like that where because he was there for like that month. So in that month, he was training with like local boxers and stuff like that and kind of just getting to know everybody being that cool dude. But, you know, here comes uh, like I'll be fine. The week of the fight, Kane, sea level, you know, or uh, above sea level and just yeah, it didn't work out at all. But like the. The fans were rooting for for Doom. It was very odd. Um, it's one of those things. I know, like Justin Gaethje has talked about fighting in Mexico. I don't think he'd get cheers, you know, despite him being like in my situation where he's half. I don't think he's going to get cheered. I know if I was fighting, I probably wouldn't get cheered in Mexico. You know, <laughs> I mean, they're they're not they're going to see you and go, "You're not Mexican, really?" Okay, you know, kind of like that, and uh, it, it kind of a funny funny culture down there i'll just say uh but um yeah i mean i don't think it's it's in in five six years there's going to be tons of mexican fighters is what i'm going to say though now maybe not as much you know so that pool is a little limited i think you could i think people can understand that and like any kind of culture or country kind of uh, really starting to get into the sport, the pool of great fighters you want to showcase is even more limited. You know, for every Brandon Moreno, there's, uh, here's a name, I don't know if you remember, uh, five Augusto Montoyas, I think his name was. And um, it's just kind of how it is, you know. It's not like when you go to Brazil, where Brazil MMA is huge. So there's a ton of, there's a big, big pool of great fighters to go to. Um, it's it's just kind of how it is, sadly. I can imagine as well with boxing being so big in Mexico, a lot of the sort of combat sports aficionados would be more interested in taking up that sport than MMA because Britain has the same thing. Exactly. Like Britain has yeah. tons of talented boxers, but they sort of pale in comparison to the amount of MMA fighters. Like we've still got good British MMA fighters, but nowhere near the amount of great British boxers. Yeah, it, it's. That's exact. That's like a very good reason as well. Another thing too is, um, obviously, Br- Britain has a fantastic wrestling scene as well, but uh, it's not quite like how Mexico is with its luchador scene. If you're like the top luchador from like history, you aren't just the number one guy in the country or in your country's promotion or whatever. You're a folk legend movie star. Your Brad Pitt meets um, meets Hercules from mythological story, and like for storytelling, uh, as well as like what I'm trying to say is you're Yoshihiro Akiyama in Japan, because he was huge in Japan. Um, Sexyama was massive in Japan, and like El Santo, Blue Demon, you know, those my my grandpa had their DVD collections of like. El Santo versus Frankenstein's monster, <laughs> like you know, that was huge in Mexico, and um, so that history and boxing, you know, and like my pick for the greatest boxer of all time, you know, Mexican fighter. Uh, I mean, there's, it's it kind of eats up that pool of young combat sport athletes kind of going into it, um, but I do think in five six years we're gonna see a ton of new names kind of reach the forefront because uh, from what I understand um, uh, amateur wrestling is starting to pick up down there like in the, like younger classes so you know that maybe that's probably where we'll go into which I'm excited of course we had that golden window a few months ago where we had three Mexican champions crowned in three months unfortunately things have taken a turn for the worse since then and just one remains. We're going to be talking about their first title defense. Alexa Grasso defends her title against the woman she won it from, Valentina Shevchenko. It's a women's flyweight main event. And Shevchenko opened the first fight as a major bookmaker's favorite. And she enters this one also as a bookmaker's favorite. I believe minus 200. Uh, she's the favorite for this one. Now, before we talk about the fight itself, though, can we give a shout out to the women's flyweight division? Like this weight class was for a long time treated as a joke, a figure of ridicule. It was it was Shevchenko mm. and the rest. 
And over the years, yeah. we've seen uh, some straw weights moving up. We've seen bantam weights move down, natural fly weights entering from outside the promotion. And now we've got a weight class, which in my opinion, I would even make the argument it's better than straw weight at this moment in time. You definitely can. Like, I was going to say, like, I think there's definitely an argument for it being better than straw weight right now. Because you have, what, Manon Frodo, Aaron Blanchfield, they fought recently and they got a lot of buzz on their fights. Uh, Talia Santos is still awesome. Uh, you know, Macy Barber's in this division. And uh, she's, <laughs> I mean, say what you want about her attitude and, you know, everything like that. I mean, she is. Uh, You're trying to bump up quite your girl, yeah. She's just marketable. I don't know why I like her. I have no idea. I, I couldn't tell you, and I don't want to say it's her marketability, but it might be. Um, uh, I like Amanda Hebos as well. She's in this Natalia division. Natalia Silva. She's a little spotty. Oh, yeah, fantastic. Uh, there's Casey O'Neill, who just lost, I think, her first fight. But, um, you know, people like – what there's you know, obviously Tracy Cortez, Miranda Maverick, uh, and then it, it, this is in – Bellator, but you have Liz Carmouche as well, who's, you know, obviously doing big things and doing very well over there. Um, I think, I mean, if you want to talk about someone like who has a, what's it called, a, the UFC really pushing, I think they're still going to try and push her, is Molly Meatball. Like, Molly Meatball will always be, like, she's a regular fixture of those UK cards. I think people have realized, yeah. like, how low her ceiling is, but she'll always be. Be yeah. so like, because she is. She's a fun, entertaining fighter. If she can keep it standing, incredibly fun, incredibly fun, honestly, and uh, <laughs> um, and of course, let's let's not forget your favorite fighter. I don't know why you. This is your favorite, but JJ Aldrich, of course. <laughs> you know, uh, she got a you know she got a finish in her last fight, and I was stunned. Me, yep. you know, if for, but, if for uh, some reason, Aaron Lipsky. If for some reason I had to take Raquel Pennington out of my uh, boys' table, I'd be open to putting JJ Aldrich in there. I know the most exciting fighter, but I find myself rooting for her. Yeah, I do too. I uh, I find myself rooting for her mostly because of uh, the the jokes <laughs> around uh, around my household about her. Nothing mean. Don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. I promise. Nothing too mean spirited. Just not. Uh, just they're just too too much of an inside joke that I'm not explaining for five hours. <laughs> yeah. What we will explain though is we'll set the scene for this title fight coming up here. Now, turn our wear heads back to March 2023, UFC 285. Um, now, I'm not going to try and rewrite history. We both picked Valentina Shevchenko to win this fight, but we did say two things which I think did prove a little bit of an omen when the fight actually played out. Russell's scrambling abilities and a fighter who was 34 years old with 20 years of fight experience was Valentina Shevchenko starting to slow down. And in my opinion, I think they were two big factors in how the fight ended up the way it did. Absolutely. Um, I think I th another thing too I think about and shout out to Alexa Grasso's camp, by the way, for... The, the you know prepping and having that much foresight and you know scouting it's fantastic but you know she's in her 30s Valentina Shevchenko and she has had a very oh, excuse me a very long career of fighting you know for a long time in the UFC like they she nothing against like Lauren Murphy but you know, she fought, like, Jennifer Maya, Caitlin Jukagian, Liz Carmouche, Jessica I. She had, like, this big, long streak in the division that was tailor-made for her. And there was a lot—I think you and me brought this up. There is a lot of footage on her. It's really easy to scout her out and just sit there and watch her fights. They're not going to be very fun, but, <laughs> you know, you can—there's a lot of footage to watch of her. And— it, it kind of makes prepping for someone a little bit easier as well. And I, part of me wonders like how big of a factor that still is. You know, when there's a lot of tape on a fighter and even if they look dominant, there's gotta be moments where they didn't look a hundred percent. 
And if there's a, like a brief moment here, a brief moment here, eventually it all adds up into, I think we see where we can exploit things, you know? Oh, and um, and Russell's team did wonders with that. I actually think Team Lobo is one of the more underrated, underrated. training camps. Like, we've seen what Diego yeah. Lopez is doing. That guy's awesome. That guy, that guy, I, I, I'm, I kind of want to throw him into the boy stable and, like, demote somebody and throw him in. But I got to be honest, I don't think he's going to be in there for very long. I think it'd be like a temp seating. He's, he's looking insane right now. Um, that gym's awesome. I'm a big fan of that gym. You know, I mean, uh, oof. And just to put this into perspective, in terms of how big of a surprise this was, we always do polls on the INC channel, uh, asking people for who they think is going to win. And only 9% of people picked Alexa Grasso for that fight, which makes it the second biggest upset since we started doing these polls. The highest being 6%. Do you want to guess which fight? Uh... Was it Wiley beating Andrade the first fight? No, that was actually quite close. I think that was about, um, I think it was Andrade sort of 63%. Huh. That was a huge one for me at the top of my head. Yeah, it was uh, Wine Mum Boxing's greatest moment. I should have known. I should have known yeah. better that. But you know me. I'm going to use any you. excuse to try and bring up that fight. It's okay. I use any excuse I can to bring up the first fight here, so <laughs> <laughs> comes full circle. <laughs> yeah, and we'll talk about the winner of that fight, Alexa Grasso, sixteen and three record. Uh, now, along with her title victory, other notable wins include uh, Viviani Arujo, Joanne Caldwood, Macy Barber, your girl, uh, Karolina Kowalczyk, when she fought back at strawweight. Uh, what's interesting to note is her losses. Very similar type of fighters: Alda Esparza. Tatiana Suarez, mm -hmm. Felice Herrick. So you may yeah. look at that and think, are there still weaknesses with her takedown defense? And maybe that's something that Valentina can exploit because she did have success in the first fight using her wrestling. Yeah, that's, in my opinion, I thought that was like where the only places she had success. Obviously, we'll probably talk about the first fight a little bit more in detail when we start like getting into the meat, the meat, the beef of this <laughs> fight. Oh, the beef. Wow. Um, <laughs> uh, and, uh, but I, I thought that's where Valentina had, I, I dare I say her only moments of success was taking her down and kind of, uh, kind of laying and praying a little bit, just content to just control her on the ground from guard uh, until the inevitable scramble came because it was kind of getting hard for Shevchenko to advance position. Because that's when Grosso's looking to pop out, you know. Uh, Grosso was very content with just kind of staying on her back, defending. And then the second she tries to pass guard, just popping out. Taking advantage of that, like, brief moment window she had. Um, but, yeah, definitely, I mean, she got taken down a lot in the first fight. And Shevchenko is no joke when it comes to taking opponents down. I mean, she took Jessica Andrade down often who has a very low center of gravity also has some issues with takedowns but very low center of gravity that does help her out in some cases um you know infamously picked uh, rose nama Yunus, uh you know and had her head hit the ceiling and then slammed her i mean so very good center of gravity and body control with her strength and valentino was taking her down like it was no problem at all so yeah. it's kind of how it is i'm personally of the belief that that's shevchenko's best win yeah because there was a lot of people Ooh. that thought Andrade could cause her problems, and that she that just co completely neutralized her. It, for me, it's in either terms that, of or value? it's either that or the Holly fight, just because of the size difference. Chev is tiny yeah. in that fight. <clears throat> yeah, it. I think in terms of name value, it's Joanna, but Joanna only had the one fight at one twenty-five, so we don't really know how well she would have been at 125. So it's a little hard to quantify that when, you know, it's something I touched on, uh, like last week, you know, with like, how big is the Rose win from a known photo kind of thing? Because it's like, ah, this is her first fight here. If Rose has this crazy streak afterwards, Hey, that wins pretty good, you know, at 125, but this is Rose at 125, not the Rose at 115. You almost have to treat it like, different fighters in my brain um 
you know, historically speaking, like, uh, like, you know, Rich Franklin, Dan Henderson, those are two guys who hopped divisions forever. And I felt like it was, you were training for different fighters at those, at, like in their primes, uh, a little bit more so because Rich Franklin was much more kick heavy at 205 whenever he would kind of go up there for like random spurts. And Dan Henderson was much more grapple heavy at 185. I'm glad you brought up the Rose fight because that's one thing I want to talk about because a lot of people forget Alexa Grasso started her career as a strawweight and she made it into the top mm. 10 and then she started to find a ceiling, especially we mentioned before, coming up against the grapplers. If we judge both Rose and Alexa on their strawweight careers, there's no question. Rose has done far more, far better than Grasso. But why Absolutely. do you think Grasso has had so much success as a flyweight in a way that Rose wasn't able to replicate in a match against Manon. I I have this theory. I, you, you know, it's always pure speculation on how much someone cuts, you know? And um, I, I'm, I, I'd be really curious how, how much a lot of these fighters cut when they're changing divisions, you know? Like, how much is Kevin Holland cutting to make 185 and 170? Like, by example... Uh, Alexa Grasso, how much was she cutting to make 115? Same with Rose. And then how much are you cutting here? Because I, Alexa Grasso was known, and she's still kind, you can argue she still kind of has this problem, but was known for having massive pillow hands at 115. And she didn't have the best kicking game, but it was there. But she was a lot of pillow hands and not the best wrestling, right? But very good technical boxing and like her combinations and stuff. So I'm wondering if, in moving up in weight, she's kind of comfortable, you know, sitting down on her punches more. And if that, like, little bit of an extra pop, so now her combinations are having a little bit of a pop to them. I wonder if that's, you know, she's able to build off that little success to kind of show off her whole game. Uh, also, she's kicking more. I wonder if that's because she feels stronger and therefore, like, a little bit more confident in stopping takedowns at this division. So, because I don't really remember her. I remember her kicking here and there at 115, but 125, I've seen her kick a lot more. And also as um, well, when you're not cutting down to 115, you're not draining yourself. Yeah. It, I, I, as a, you know, I'm, I'm in football and wrestling country, you know. It's a lot of wrestlers and football players, you know, where I grew up and everything like that in Oklahoma. And, uh, or still live in, you know, Oklahoma, but... Um, in my high school, I used to see a bunch of guys wearing trash bags running around the campus before going to class because they're cutting weight. And I go, how, how do you live? Like, what's wrong with you? Like, it's an, it's just a brutal, brutal, brutal thing. And I'm so glad I never chose to cut weight in my life. So, I mean, it's rough. Yeah. So, Grasso, of course, a former strawweight who moved up. Valentina Shevchenko, former bantamweight who moved down. Uh, we'll look at some of her notable victories over the years. Uh, they include Tyler Santos, Jessica Andrade, uh, Caitlin Chukasian, maybe not the most spectacular fighter, but very difficult to put away. Shevchenko made it look easy. Uh, Liz Carmouche, Jennifer Meyer, Ioana, where she ended up winning the belt, and her bantamweight successes, Juliana Pena, Holly Holm, and Sarah Kaufman, the former Strikeforce champion. So a real sort of who's who of women's MMA across two weight classes, and she broke Ronda's record for the most title defences uh, most successive title defenses uh, for a female. So, very credential athlete. But this is going to be a new situation for her in that, like, it's the first time since, what, 2017 she's coming off a loss. So it's going to be interesting yeah. to see when you've been on top for so long, how you're able to respond to it. Because I think it's going to be... I think it's a very fascinating situation on how Valentina approaches this fight. And... We'll talk about it a little bit later on in the show. I've got this fear that she's not going to make the sufficient changes that I feel she requires to win this fight. We're 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 on a similar path here. You know, we haven't really talked. For the record, for the viewers out there, we ha we don't discuss what we're really feeling like in depth beforehand to kind of you know make it a more fun whenever one proposes an idea and back and forth. Um, you know, we'll be like, oh, I'm picking so-and-so, heads up. Like, it's mostly like that in her talks, but it looks like you and me might be on a similar path here on this road. 
Um, I'm very curious about the mental state of her. You know, I, th I think like, mental, what's her mental like? I think her mental fortitude is, I think it's going to be there. I'm not expecting her to sort of implode okay. when she faces adversity or something like that because Chip Chengo's had setbacks before. She's lost. Yeah. She's lost before in the MMA career, so I don't expect that. But I do think there's there's sometimes an element with Shevchenko. And don't get me wrong, I hold Valentina in very high regard. But I do think sometimes there's an element of, oh, it wasn't my fault I lost, it was X. Yeah. And I think maybe sometimes you have to have that when you're in this kind of sport. You've got to think, you've got to have that sort of self-belief. So maybe it is sort of a normal thing, but it is something I've noticed with Chev. She's she's incredibly pissed about the, the first fight. Um, there's a uh, I, I personally don't agree with the idea of oh I lost it was but it wasn't because of me it was because of this I understand having the self confidence and self belief but I also think of self responsibility so I'm a big fighting game player and I'm always really interested in the mindsets of fighting game players because I think it's like I honestly think it's adjacent to MMA. Uh, or like any combat sports or any sports really, um, but uh, what, there's a there's a mentality or like a saying we'll say in um, in in fighting games, and I'm not directly calling Valentina anything here. I want to stress, uh, I, I I remember the heat I've gotten from Valentina fans. You know, we we cool guys, I promise. But <laughs> there's a uh, there's a, a saying called scrub quotes. You know. The scrub mentality, which is, uh, you, like I lost in a fighting game or I lost in something. Um, it's not my fault though. My controls didn't work. Your character's cheating. Uh, my internet was lagging. My, you know, uncle's goldfish died. I'm been distracted. You know, like all these like, like mindless excuses. And once again, I'm not saying that Mount Valentina. I've seen we've seen fighters throughout the years who, you know, my foot was a balloon. Like, come on. But we, we've seen, we've seen some crazy. I don't know. Um, that accent was just there for the taking. I, I don't. I'm, tr I'm starting out like this one man comedy shtick, and so uh, <laughs> I just put their own accent to be funny. Um, my foot was a balloon, oh. <laughs> and Valentina has been very, 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 very salty about this loss. She's been going. I fought perfectly, and I never made a single mistake. And then she got lucky for this one in a lifetime move. Then, like, here comes the footage of them practicing it. Lucky. And I'm like, okay. You know, despite the fact that, you know, all of this stuff and all the technical things, such as when Valentina is forced to back up and she's being walked down and made to back up, she throws a random spin for no real reason. And, Valen and Alexa Grosso's camp knew that. And they punished her for it incredibly perfect and because uh, it's not you know it's it was genius it's perfect perfect game planning and I, I know i've seen debate back and forth some people say it was 2-1 chev some people say it was 2-1 grasso i'm of the 2-1 grasso camp but once again have to stress my scorecards are a little biased i think we all know that so grain of salt with mine with my scorecards your scorecards are probably more accurate and i'm personally 2-1 um, chev I, I give chev the second yeah, and third round yeah, yeah, I, I, you know, I got to be honest with you. Now that I really think about it, everyone I know in real life, that's 2-1 Grosso. We're Grosso fans. Um, I like her fighting style, too. I'm not just, I'm not just a single man, I promise. But, um, <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, I, I, I think that fight's pretty close. And I think Grosso is... It's kind of taking it to her at times. When I was rewatching this fight, I was like, man, Gr Grosso's kind of showing up Chev at times. And then Chev will, you know, get back into the fight. You know, but there's moments where Grosso's kind of taking it to her, I felt like. And um, I, I, I I, admittingly wonder what that does to you whenever it's – you start blaming things. You start calling it luck going into a fight. Like, how are people saying she's the best? Like – I make one mistake and I'm not the best anymore. Yeah, that's how fighting works. I kind of wanted to do that. That that quote personally really irked me. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm like, I'm genuinely kind of curious about it. 
you know, of how she handles because she's lost before. I, I'm not I'm not trying to take a shot at your girl, but with Rhonda, we've never seen her lose before, so it's understandable, you know, um, that things can ha- everyone handles loss differently, and that was the first time Rhonda lost. So Chef's lost before, but. I also kind of think back. I don't remember her complaining too much after the first Nunez fight, but I remember complaining about the second one. Well, I thought Chef won the but second fight. Was, yeah, her nose was rose, you know. Um, her nose was rose. I, I, I like how she says that. I like how she rolls her R there. You know, good accent, honestly. So you've um, had the opportunity to watch the first fight between the two. Technically, yeah. what were your biggest takeaways from this? What was Grasso having success with? What was Chev having success with? What can you see both trying to tweak for this rematch? I I, I really liked how Grasso was hand fighting when they when she had to. Um, she was pressuring with combinations. Uh, it, I, it, I I hate bringing this example up, but like you know, there's a the Anderson Silva, you know, talk the the first Anderson Silva fight with Chris Weidman. Where Andrew Silva was used to guys coming at her, coming at him like one two, one two, left right, left right. Um, nothing against Valentina's previous opponents, but when the best striker technically was Joanna, who you know I don't think looked very good in that fight, admittingly. But before, but after that, it's probably Andrade, who is you know coming at her like you know throwing big wild hooks, and so she was kind of content with like you know being cool, calm, collected, but then someone coming in and, like, actually doubling up on sides and punches, really pressuring, fighting southpaw, going at her from the southpaw was huge for Grosso in that fight. Um, I thought she was using inside kicks whenever she needed to, but that was interesting, and she's really pressing forward with combinations, which uh, Shevchenko isn't the type of fighter of, like, oh, you're moving forward, I'm going to bite down on the mouthpiece and, you know, stand here and go, because that isn't necessarily the smartest thing. You kind of want to circle and move. And Grosso was cutting her off, was pressuring and cutting her off when she had to, forcing Shevchenko to the cage and trying to get work there. And that kind of what led into what Chev was able to have success with, which is where Grosso was always pressuring forward with punches. And if she put throws herself off balance, Shevchenko was timing takedowns and trips very well off of a Grosso engage, like, or stepping forward and looking to engage. So definitely um, the fight kind of played out based on, like, the aggression levels and everything like that. On the ground, uh, honestly, that's probably the slickest non-black belt back take I've ever seen, though. Like, that fight finish? Incredible. Um, Oh, another thing I remember... Shevchenko also, um, for someone who spins an awful lot, she doesn't spin with purpose. It, they're just kind of like quirks or sporadic. Um, she doesn't really spin with a purpose. I'm a big fan of spinning with a purpose. Um, I don't think you should ever spin off your back foot, personally. You know, unless you're in a Jean-Claude Van Damme movie. Don't recommend it. Just don't recommend it. Um, and Shevchenko, whenever she's pressured to the cage... She always spins in prior fights. And, of course, you know, uh, Team Lobo, they, they, they recognize that. And that back take is incredibly smooth. Um, it really made Grasso, who has had submission wins on her road to the title, look very good on the ground. And, hey, you know, we see Diego Lopez, who's their coach there, for grap- one of their grappling coaches. So that makes sense. Like obviously, everyone remembers the sort of fight finishing sequence when it comes to Grasso's grappling. What did you make of the two when they were on the ground? Because a lot of the reason that people think that Sheb took the took rounds two and three was because of the success that she had on the ground. She was taking Grasso down. She was working into Crucifix, which is becoming sort of like the Shevchenko forte sure. these days. And yeah, how do you think those sort of tweaks are going to be implemented? Because you know that Sheb's going to try and get to this move. It's become sort of um, like she's finished uh, Caitlin Chukasian with it. She finished Jessica Andrade with it. Um, she landed some good ground to pound against Grasso in the first fight. I don't think she was ever yeah. close to getting the finish, but again, it's another sort of... It's one of her sort of biggest avenues for victory in this day and age. Yeah, it's like the... It's her Hulk Hogan leg drop, of course, in a sense. like because It feels like her finishing move, you know? That's what I mean by it. It's, it's like her signature thing. Yeah, basically, that's the best way to say it. 
her or you know with Mexican fighters her fry, her frog splash and uh, yeah it, it's I, I I wonder if Diego Lopez is really emphasizing working off her back I'm, I'm really wondering that another thing I'm really curious about is is Grosso going to come out orthodox or southpaw for the fight because I think and I think this is I'm pretty sure it's just true, but um, not, a, not I was never a very good wrestler to be able to tell you. <laughs> um, but like in researching it, and I've seen other people talk about it, when it's an open side matchup, when someone's changing levels to shoot, the rear knee is right there. So I'm wondering if they're going to, if they come out orthodox, it could be a situation of like they're looking to time an uppercut or a knee. On, because uh, I mean, I think Shevchenko is going to look to grapple this fight. I think that's based on how much success she had in the first fight with it. But I also really wonder on the ground, I wonder if Diego Lopez is going to tell her, don't be content just sitting there and waiting to scramble. You might need to actively do something. And I wonder if that could get her in trouble. Because as good as she looked on the ground, you know, with her scrambles and her back take and the finishing sequence and all that. Her grappling isn't her main forte. She's good at it. She's very good at it. but Or at least pretty good at it. But it's not her main forte. And with someone the experience of Shevchenko, who, who's had, let's be honest, more wins than she's had fights, then, you know, having that kind of experience in there to take advantage of mistakes, that's kind of where experience, I feel like, it really is, is taking adv- making less mistakes than taking advantage of mistakes. I, I, I admittingly kind of wonder... It's gonna ha- like if if she tries to let's say go for a triangle and she escapes and gets dominant position and Shevchenko capitalizes on it or something and um, or goes for an arm bar and steps through like manages to step out of it pull her out get great positioning and work for a finishing sequence I mean I, I'm I'm genuinely really curious if they're deciding for a more active play off the bottom or if they're pretty content with what they did in the first fight, which I don't think might not be. The, I don't I don't know what the correct play would be here. Um, I mean, the correct play is just don't get taken down, but that's easier said than done, let's be honest. Because one of the things so. I've noticed from looking at social media for this fight is uh, there was a picture which did the rounds on social media of Alexa Grasso after a training session, and her upper body looked absolutely massive. I think she's preparing for a grappling heavy chef, either to stuff the takedowns or to power out when she does get taken down, I think she's preparing herself for that. Um, did you mm. get any, any sort of inkling base of that? I have one theory. What if she wants this upper body strength to bully her in the clinch and hypothetically she pins her to the cage, Shevchenko to the cage for five rounds? If only there was a term for that kind of fighting, but it'd be very reminiscent of Holly. <laughs> I love ho- Holly. I Holm. love how Holly Holm has become a verb. I, I, you know what I really like about it? It's gotten traction on our channel. Like it, it's, it started off as a joke, and then like I've seen people in our comments like, yeah, it was a lot of Holly homing. Yo, we're getting it all like. There. Yes, dude. We didn't even have to like sell out Wembley with a a side thing and like have a band or have our band play to get this over. You know, poor Fozzy. Um, <laughs> Judas um, is a legitimately I'll, good song. I, I I actually have that song and have it on my Spotify and I love it. Um, but I do think it's really funny that Chris Jericho <laughs> said. We we did we sold we did we did a sold out show to eighty one thousand people. No 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 that doesn't count. Those people were there for wrestling. They weren't there for for Fozzy. All right, stop trying to cheat the numbers here. That's like saying like UFC two twenty nine was the biggest selling pay per view of all time because of Nick Lentz. Yeah, exactly. You know it's or like Ian Gary saying he carried that prior card. Oops, oops. <laughs> Someone um, made a comparison with this fight, and we'll start sort of ra- um, sort of wrapping things up mm-hmm. a little bit here because um, I've got uh, I'm dog yeah. sitting, hence the um, new surroundings here. So I'm around my um, around sort of one of my uh, parents' houses here. Um, someone made a comparison with this fight. What this fight mm-hmm. is is Leon Edwards versus Kamara Usman three, in that yes, 
in that the champion is the one that feels like they've still got a lot more to learn and have taken the steps to try and improve. Whereas the loser is the one who thinks, I was winning the first fight comfortably, all I need to do is just tweak little bits here and there and I'll still get the same result. I'm not making the same mistake then as I did for the second Usman fight and pick the wrong winner. I think I got it this time. I'm in the same boat. Because I think I picked Usman to win the second. I think I picked the second. I think I picked Usman in the second fight, but for third fight. I picked Leon for the second fight and I picked Usman for yeah, the third. You did. Um, yeah, I think I... And here, I'm... I'm you know, I, I... She, it's my girl. Like, we used to talk about it. She, she graduated from my girl stable. And I didn't pick her in going into the chef fight. I'm not making that mistake again. I'm picking Grasso to win here. I'm in the um, same boat. I, yeah. Um, I think that's a perfect analogy, though. This t is so reminiscent of the Usman-Leon rivalry. I think we're going to get a very close fight. I think you're going to get a lot of people who are going to make the argument that uh, Chev wins. But I'm picking Grasso mm -hmm. to win 48-47. Yeah, I, I think... I, I, I don't I think it's gonna be a decision. I think Grosso does win. I think forty eight forty seven also makes sense. But part of me does wonder you've been striking for, if you've been striking for a while and you have this quirk and no one's really punished you for it for years and years and years, can you you know, there's the saying you can teach an old dog new tricks. I, I totally believe that. But can you unlearn a trick for years that you had for years? I wonder if if she's going to lose based on getting her back taken out. Bit her back taken in like two or three rounds. And not finished. Let's say she defends the choke. But I wonder if that could be like a similar downfall. as that same kind of similar pressure game. But I think Grosso takes it regardless. And I fully expect Valentina to say, But her nose was a rose with my bunches. Um... One of my favorite little quirks about that fight, because I actually, I actually thought Nunez won the fight, um, uh, as much to the, the 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 disagreement on that one. But yeah, I'm just that's reaching, why we're good. That's why we're. That's why, I'm just reaching yeah, for the off button. I noticed. <laughs> I, not, I, I noticed you have my termination papers there. Can I ask why? Um, <laughs> no, I'm not that bitter. I'm not that bitter. Don't worry about that. <laughs> Don't worry. Yeah. Now, I if I talk about another Nunez fight. I do I'm have a bit of a bold prediction, though, when it comes to Chev, because we're going to... Now, this is off the pretense that we're expecting... Like, we both picked Grosso to win this one, so Chev's going to be coming mm -hmm. off a loss. And I've got a bit of a bold prediction if that plays out. Currently, there are three women who are bickering between one another for who fights for the vacant 135 belt. So it's either Pena, Rocky, or Myra Bueno Silva. My prediction mm -hmm. is whoever doesn't get that title fight will be fighting Shevchenko moving back up to 135. And that's going to be a number one contender match. I think so too. Or even funnier, we get Shevchenko home too. See, I didn't hate, They're gonna try I didn't hate the first fight. No. That's good, because Shevchenko wins. You know? Holly Holm didn't get to her game plan. She got dominated. Um, <laughs> that's how I remember it, at least. Now, if Holly Holm got to... Actually, that was also, like, 2016 Holly Holm, where she was still awesome. Yeah, and not clinching so, against the fence. Yeah. That, you know, they, that was before Greg Jackson, like, really got that exciting fighter. Just her and Winkle John, just him and Winkle John, just ring all that exciting out of fighters. Um, sport killers, as Dana White says, and I'm with them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> How do you say that when Carlos Condit trained at that camp? But um, uh, yeah, it, I I think they're going to try to get Hall. I, I wouldn't be surprised. Like as much as it's a joke, I wouldn't be surprised if Chev fights Holly at 35 after this. Because so I think they're just going to try and. Bring, keep bringing Holly out, you know, Preacher's daughter coming in. I, I'm I, Honestly, you know, like how women's 145 right now is this sort of 
like this ghost town where it's the vision but it's not really like i honestly wouldn't be surprised if they try and wheel out holly holm and put him against like norma dumont for the vacant belt felicia spencer comes out of retirement yeah. it'd be awesome actually actually i, I would love that i love felicia but she was awesome she was fun you know like uh our minds aren't in the gutters she was actually <laughs> fun <laughs> Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it's, um, a, another fighter is funny enough, funny enough bringing her up because her and Grasso are like way too innocent for their own good. For the, for the, for the, for the internet, they're way too innocent for the internet. Yeah. Poor Alexa Grasso after winning the title, they go, what do you mean? I, I painted my nails. No, it's right here. Show off my painted nails. No. And she like shows her foot on like a live stream. No, 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 no. You miss Grasso. No, no, don't do that. Don't don't do that. Don't. You have to understand. <laughs> Ask. <laughs> what's it called? Some people can be Felice Herrig, and there's not or Angela Magana. And there's nothing wrong with that. But you know, we like our grosses and Felicia Spencers. Yep. Um, I can hear my dogs barking outside here. So before I go Terry Funk on Cuda Brown, I think we'll need to wrap things up here. Uh, on the whole, Joe, your uh, opinions on. A Noche UFC. Um, disappointing, but it's it's mostly. Um, I mean, actually, I think Christos Diagos versus uh, Daniel Seth Huber might be actually kind of fun. That was another fight we didn't talk about. That fight could be actually pretty good. It's a lightweight fight. But um, that said, I think what's it called? Uh, I think this. I, I'm I'm excited for the main event. I'm really excited for the co-main. Uh, it just needs that well, like that one more fight. For me to go, oh, this is a prime fight night card. Um, and if it was Shavkat, you guys, I, I would rather buy this card than to the, you know, the one tonight. Yeah. Um, and of course, <laughs> if, by uh, the Shavkat. of course, by the time that this video does go online, you'll have done your post fight recap of UFC 293. Whether Israel Adesanya yep. picks up another title defense, or we uh, talking about one of the biggest upsets of all time with Sean Strickland. So we got all that to look forward to. Yeah, I'm really, uh, I mean, by the time this video comes out, oh, excuse me, by the, by the time this video comes out, you would have uh, heard me singing the praises of how we're in the worst possible timeline because Sean Strickland beat Israel Adesanya by knockout in the first 30 seconds. Um, we'd also love your opinions as well of what you think of this sort of Brucey bonus preview show. Uh, is this something that you'd like to see a little bit more of? Would you like us to cover more fight nights would you like us to cover a uh, non-ufc shows like would you like us to preview uh the pfl championship or bellator 300 we'd love to have any kind of uh say that you want to have regarding the channel um i have two weeks off as well so hopefully on the main channel we'll be seeing a lot more content because i've got a video a career retrospective which i am really excited about i think i've done a really good job on this one uh, shout out as well to uh, dominic our narrator probably his best performance so far also, we've got quite a few retro reviews, which we've got uh, building up in the backlog. So we'll try and work on those. Uh, we're trying to get out as much content as we possibly can. Obviously, the real world comes first. So uh, we're not uploading content as regularly as we can. But we appreciate your patience. Uh, we appreciate all the support that you've given us here on Patreon or in the comments section. And again, we just want to say a big thank you. Uh, for now, though, my name has been Carl Bainbridge. That's been Joe Neal. Uh, this has been the Nortier UFC preview show, and we'll hope to see you again in October. UFC 294 is just around the corner. Bye-bye for now.